Hi, good morning. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, this session is Managing Funds in the Post-COVID Era. Uh, my name is Shai Oster. I'm the Asia Bureau Chief of the Information. Uh, it's a tech publication headquartered in uh, San Francisco, and I'm here in Hong Kong. And joining me today, uh, we have a, a really good panel uh, with a wide variety of experiences in public-private markets, uh, entrepreneurship, ranging from food to biotech. Um, and others. Uh, and uh, I'll just do a quick introductions. We have, um, I guess, I don't know if the audience is the same way I do, but assuming you do, to my this direction, uh, you see um, Tian Chet Chu, who is a managing partner for Polar Ventures, um, has deep experience in tech investing uh, and banking beforehand, including Goldman Sachs. Uh, we have below uh, managing uh, Matilda Ho, uh, managing director of Bits and Bytes, uh, which is basically looking at food tech and with particular uh, not just about food, but uh, an angle on on sustainability and um, environmentalism, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, jumping back up again is um, Daniel Kubelknam, who's a managing partner, Convergent Partners, who's joining us from Zurich. And they're looking at cross-border uh, uh, VC and investing, and particularly looking at bringing uh, European-based uh, med tech and health tech uh, and seeing how it can be applied in uh, Asia, in particular China. Is that correct? Uh, and then finally uh, is Michael Blake, who's the CEO for Asia of a private bank, um, yeah, uh, Union Bancaire Privé, uh, UBP, I should never try to pronounce that again, uh, and also has uh, deep experience in managing money and growing the pot. And our topic today is how are we going to, what are we going to do in the post-COVID era? And uh, obviously everything has changed to the point where even uh, conferences now are no longer in the lobbies of hotels, uh, but over Zooms and everyone's calling from there. Interestingly, I noticed that everyone's in their office, so we're not in complete lockdown. Um, but so let me start off with um, the question is, what are the greatest risks on the horizon? And uh, I think that's sort of a broad question that everyone can address from their angle and also take the opportunity while addressing that question to do a little pitch about how they see, broad, more broadly speaking, the biggest shift in the post-COVID era. Uh, and why don't we start with uh, Matilda, if that's okay? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. Um, I would say that the liquidity has definitely um, dramatically declined uh, this year in the capital market. And we now starting to see that the allocation of the fund only goes into the best in class companies. Um, there are still some really amazing startups being oversubscribed, but majority um, of the startups are definitely suffering, um, both in terms of the number of the deals and the funding size has uh, uh, hit the record low since 2015, uh, specifically in the agriculture and food sector. Um, and I would say that the biggest risk um, in the horizon, I would say, uh, particularly in the ag food sector, is the availability of the growth capital. Uh, we do now see uh, thousands of early stage company from C stage to series A and B, um, uh, uh, both in, in China, Asia and globally. However, um, there are not sufficient amount of the uh, mainstream growth stage VCPEs uh, money that go into the ecosystem to continue to support uh, the growth momentum of those companies. Um, and of course, uh, looking ahead, more successful IPOs and unicorns in this space will definitely bring in more mainstream uh, PEs and crossover financial institutions to come in. Um, and also the rising importance of the sustainability and impact investing will also likely to bring more family offices and foundations to come into this space. Um, but that being said, um, we, we I don't think that the reality is not that rosy. Um, the economic mm -hmm. uncertainty continues to be a huge risk factor. So we believe that in the long run, um, this economic headwinds and the growing appetite of those crossover investors will continue to coexist um, in this sector. Interesting. So just to, just to clarify, is that a view from Shanghai or is that more broadly for the uh, food tech, agrotech? 
Yeah, we we are a Chinese market investor, um, but all the companies that we invested could be domestic or internationally. And right. as long as their technology can be adopted and commercialized in the Chinese market, um, but uh, what what uh, what I was sharing is more of an ecosystem overall um, international. Thanks, uh, Tian. Can you hop in and give us uh, where do you think is the biggest shift post COVID, the biggest risk? I guess the um, I actually agree with Matilda. Uh, liquidity is the biggest uh, biggest issue, uh, particularly around uncertainty. That, that there's just you know no one's got that crystal ball that can really figure out where, where things are gonna gonna uh, go. So so really the challenge for for companies, um, which is also exacerbated by the reluctance of funders uh, into funds, is having liquidity. Um, now now taking the perspective of a company. I think there are three types of, and this impacts the post-COVID world, there's going to be three types of companies. There are those that are really flourishing. Uh, for example, the online delivery, online type of um, businesses, and they're, they're going gangbusters. Um, and they're, um, you know, we got involved in a, uh, a top-up round um, for uh, uh, some uh, business uh, in India. However, um, there's the other end of the spectrum where there are businesses that have really sort of... Uh, uh, you know, going to be challenged and have actually disappeared um, or will disappear. They just cannot sustain themselves. Um, uh, you know, the, the government money, the handouts, uh, the restrictions will essentially um, keep those uh, keep those companies essentially um, uh, uh, in, in dire straits and potentially shutting forever. And that has already happened to a lot of small, medium-sized enterprises. Right. Uh, yeah. The, the 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 middle piece, which is really where. Um, uh, investment policy and uh, uh, and I guess uh, a little bit of hard work will, will could make a difference is in those businesses which um, in a normalized environment will be uh, can be successful can generate positive cash flow um, are starved right now um, there, there's a saying I got on my little uh, I wouldn't uh, chat which was uh, a new term either deck. Uh, Earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and coronavirus. So, if you, um, if you basically take that out and normalize it, I think that's another space where where a lot of companies are going to be challenged to ride this uh, this interim period. Um, so, so I, I think that's going to be a real real issue to address. Right. Uh, it's interesting, sort of the, the, the referring to sort of the K-shaped recovery, right? Where if you're uh, in online delivery, you're great, but if you're um, sort of more traditional business, then you're in trouble. Um, Daniel, what's your view on, on on the risks? And I think this is probably you might have a more rosy outlook, given the the, the sectors that you're looking at. Yeah, so you know, I think the so our sector focuses very much on health tech, so which is um, you know, digital health and you know medical devices, and I think especially within digital health, we've seen enormous growth, right, in um, in momentum. You know, some of these companies, um, they you know just posted record revenues, um, uh, both established and also some of the young companies that we are that we are following. And um, I think the whole development of you know sectors like telehealth and um, and you know digital diagnostics etc has been brought forward uh, by probably at least three years right um, compared to um, you know normal times. So um, on one hand, enormous uh, momentum here, and uh, what we are seeing here in Europe that um, you know a lot of these startups they're very actively looking to Asia now right, whereas before they would look to the U.S. first. And then um, you know, maybe to the Asian market second, but we're seeing actually more and more companies that are now you know, interested in going to China first, uh, maybe going through local regulatory approval, and then um, you know maybe later on you know go to the U.S. because they, they see you know China um, as the only country you know open for business. So I think right. this is um, a, you know key observation you know, of us, and I think in terms of the key risks. Um, um, I think the most obvious one is obviously the you know vaccine not coming as quickly as um, anticipated, and also um, in Europe, um, so we heard this week that probably half of the people are not willing to get um, you know, vaccinated, right? So I think there's um, you know definitely you know COVID is is here to stay for a while in our opinion, uh, and I think we need to prepare for that. Um, half of Europeans, I thought it was just an American. Uh... It's the same statistic here, actually. Yeah. Sorry, just a moment of hitting my head on the table. Um, 
So, Michael, how you know you're you're the guy? So you've heard these views on on sort of um, sector risks, um, and it, what's interesting is that people talk about liquidity a lot. But on this other, you know, uh, I've been looking at you know S and P and the, the, the stock markets are obviously uh, maybe it's FOMO driving it higher and higher. But so you, as a money guy, how are you looking at the risks, and how are you you know are you just going to go all into uh, you know, just chasing the one big deal, or are you looking at just focusing on the public markets for now? What's changed for you since COVID? So, so look specifically to to, to your question on um, on public markets. I mean, I think um, uh, specifically on equities, uh, we think PE is PE is definitely high, um, but at the same time, earnings um, are, are relatively low and, and I think um, particularly on the points that were just were just made within the, the quality growth sector there is there's still potential for further for the, um, upside um, I mean fundamentally we see a couple of dynamics here which are driving the markets um, the first would be a, a cyclical dynamic um, where we, we, we do envisage earnings improving over the course of 2021 um, and I think secondly and probably more importantly we see a very strong secular dynamic um, where we see the increasing impact of, um, of digitization. And if you're able to, to identify um, companies and trends within markets which, which are supported by those two, uh, those two trends, then I think actually there is, there is definitely further opportunity in the markets. Now, one thing that was interesting is this theme I wanted to go back about liquidity and um, how are you all looking at um, raising money, getting access to capital, right? So the market is uh, um, drowning in debt, right? Government issued debt, right? There's an, And uh, again, the public markets are at all time highs. Um, but you've talked about um, how hard it is for the growth equity, uh, growth capital. Um, and I'd like to hear more uh, from our investor side, uh, the VCs. Uh, how they see, uh, like, is it harder for them to go in and try to raise more money? Are they seeing, you know, nervousness among the family investors and any institutions that they talk to? And I open that to anyone who wants to jump in on that. So I think, you know, in, in general, there's been a significant decline in um, VC funding by institutional investors uh, this year, um, probably, you know, minus, you know, 30, 40 percent compared to the year, you know, 2019. Um, but um, on the other hand, um, you know, the investments still get done, right? And I think a lot of LPs um, um, actually indicated or, you know, at least as but what I've heard, have allocated to funds uh, without having met the um, you know the the team's life right, which I found quite remarkable, um, and you know the same applies to um, to really funding you know startups. Um, uh, again, you know funding has declined, but you know we continue to see deals being done. Um, also for Europe, I mean I would consider if, if you do um, a kind of a Series B of ten to fifteen million is large considered in Europe, and mm. I'm seeing you know, a, a number of grants like this getting done. You know so. Um, I think um, investment activity remains, you know, depressed, but you know it's happening. And uh, but uh, you know, again, the later stage companies are favored. Um, so, so quality, right? There's definitely more scrutiny in you know where, where the money goes. Right. If I may, if I may just add to that, I mean, I think um, the the two questions that we most commonly get asked by by our clients. So first of all, the the the, the opportunities for, for income in 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 a low yield environment, and secondly, um, actually, Shai, the question you just asked, which is, which is, are equities overvalued? And I think um, one of the one of the things that that's leading to is is to an adjusted allocation from families between public and private markets. Hmm. A much greater de de desire to invest in private markets, um, whether that's yield enhancing investments or whether it's uh, growth equity. Um, it's a very strong trend at the moment. That's interesting. So that might be good news. Matilda, I could see that you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, more from the Chinese angle that I think now Chinese economy, um, of course, is also facing downward pressure. 
and uh, the companies that most suffering are the ones that are uh, you know really deeply affected by the international trade. However, on the flip side, we also have seen a positive inward momentum that government takes um, in terms of a lot of mi meaningful initiatives to foster the innovation. And one is that we're starting to see more and more smart money from the SOEs, from the government and the government backed funds. Before 2018, most of the LPs that back the VCs across all sectors are mainly financial institutions. And now the largest single source of the fundings are either from the national funds or the funds backed by the regional government. And all these fund managers are now taking the government agenda and prioritize. And we hear loud and clear from the latest 14 five-year plan that um, the strength using the technology innovations to strengthen the self-sufficiency of the supply chain will continue to be uh, one of the most important things that the government is pushing for. So now uh, we, we do see that this is definitely a good signal for the entire ecosystem that the government is really backing um, a lot of those tech enabled solutions uh, to implement. Interesting. Is that going to crowd out the private investors? Um, I think this is uh, actually more and more corporate back, uh, corporate back venture capitalists are taking the government's cues to now putting more and more their R&D to really uh, work into those startups. So we, we're actually seeing more and more commercial pilots happening uh, because, because of that government's uh, directions. Interesting, because I know the, the was it the mm -hmm. government guidance funds, there's sort of been talk about the government amassing sort of an, an enormous war chest of about $200 billion. Um, but it was never clear if that was actually gonna start materializing. Uh, but you're seeing now money is actually being put to work. Yes. Very yes. interesting. Um, Tian, how do you see, you know, in terms of raising capital and, and um, putting it to work now? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, from the raising capital side, and uh, we deal with a lot of family offices, um, there's, there's a lot of waiting on the sidelines. There's, there, there's nothing obvious there in terms of asset allocation, which is probably why you've got the question of where do we put, uh, where do we put our money you know, Main Street so overval overvalued, um, what do we do? I, I think the challenge, um, certainly from the investment side, is where do you find the misprice? And uh, there are a lot of good actors in companies, um, particularly tech, they've grown, but a lot of that value has been priced in. There's a lot right. of companies in the public markets, um, but their value has also been priced in. Um, I actually think a, a, a coming space that could be quite interesting is at the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, you talk about debt. I think there's going to be a lot of um, distress and special situation opportunities coming up, um, particularly in markets where the laws are a little bit more opaque, a little bit harder to see, because that creates even more uncertainty. Um, I, I started my career called in a special situation of distress there, so, so that, that, that's my home. We haven't seen a true operational distressed market, I'm not much financially oriented. A couple of debt. So debt is, um, the, the, you know, we, we've seen some interesting developments, speaking of debt, in the Chinese markets where bond defaults are being allowed to happen. Um, when you talk about distressed debt, I mean, I know doing debt in China it would be very uh, challenging. Do you see that as when you're talking about debt? Are you talking about the China market or are you talking elsewhere where there might um, be? I'm actually talking uh, uh, pretty much across the region. Uh, you know, we're looking at the ASEAN space, um, particularly Indonesia, uh, which is a scary place for a lot of people. And, um, um, and, and like China, there's a lot of, um, it's very difficult to predict the outcome uh, of, uh, you know, the recoveries from your debt because um, it's not that the country's regimes are better or worse. It's just that um, the U.S., Europe has had a couple of hundred years of legal precedent and precedent to rely on. Uh, for example, China's uh, bankruptcy laws were only written in 2005, so it just hasn't been enough time. Uh, it's getting much more predictable now, but it's, it, it just takes time. So as a result, when, when we look at opportunities, um, it, it, it's hard to be a, a pure um, uh, investor without getting into the weeds because I think the real differentiator here is actually having operational involvement, really understanding what's going on locally. Um, otherwise, it's really hard to get insights. Um, but, but I think that's really where there's going to be a, a large need for both um, uh, uh, you know, sort of companies to clean themselves up 
as well as the rescue financing that has to come in for companies that are, are desperately trying to find funding to get them through this, this interim period. Um, and, and I believe there's not a lot of focus there right now um, when I think there should be, because that, that will be quite critical for, uh, for the, the, the recovery, shall we say, of, of the large sector of the economy. So interesting. So you're saying going in to lend money as opposed to buying equity? Possibly, yeah, yeah. And the, the investment thesis is if it works out, uh, you can capture some of the upside. Um, if it doesn't work out, then you actually take over the asset and, and, and be the owner going forward. Uh, yeah, but in, so this would be less of a like a, less of a platform play, right? Because there's usually not much of an asset if it's like a e-commerce marketplace, for example. Like, doesn't that's matching you know buyers and sellers? What kind of what kind of industry yeah. would that be appropriate? I, I guess the uh, the distressed um, or uh, turnaround market is, is much more oriented towards asset-backed businesses, um, mm -hmm. especially real estate guys. Um, it'll be hard to give that sort of. Uh, um, uh, mindset to uh, a new tech business. To your point, if there's no online asset apart from connecting, you know, A to B, um, that that's really hard to um, recover once it's gone. Uh, and there's there's nothing left. I mean, you, you can you can't sell it in some server. That's that's really not worth anything. Um, but I think asset back based or backed um, opportunities are going to be quite quite um, quite a need and interesting. Um, um, in the next year, next couple of years, I think, um, and, and again, that that's an area where there's um, there's quite a lot of potential mispricing because there's just not a lot of bidders, and there's going to be a growing number of people trying to sort of find financing on the back of that. Interesting. Now, how um, how do we see? The, you know, this is we're in Asia, so let's talk about like well, obviously, uh, wh where are the places to invest in this market? Um, uh, I, I sitting here in Hong Kong. Obviously, we have a, a geographic bias towards China. Um, I recently interviewed um, one of the senior executives at Didi, and they uh, were saying that uh, business was actually doing pretty well, and that's because of uh, um, consumer confidence. Really, the the confidence in going out in the street, you know, and getting in a taxi and one of the things they pointed to was the success of their um, designated driver program. So people are going out getting so drunk they can't drive themselves home, so they're hiring a DD driver to bring them back safely, uh, which really does give you a sense of, like, um, people letting off steam. Um, but uh, you talk about Indonesia. Uh, I sort of I have a hard time figuring out whether it's falling apart or if it's doing well. Uh, obviously, it's a very diverse geography there. Um, we do know that, you know, what's interesting there is that I mean, there's also a new thing that's happening. Even if Indonesia is struggling with the virus, um, you know, uh, C, uh, the um, formerly Garena, the gaming and um, uh, e-commerce company, is now worth something nearing $90 billion. Uh, to me, it was just, uh, I hadn't, it sort of snuck up on me. So it shows the Southeast Asia market is capable of producing a company that's rapidly approaching China size in terms of market value. Um, and you have obviously Grab and Gojek there, those two giants locked in, a, uh, you know, with their, with their jaws clamped around each other's throats. Um, they'll either merge or die together. Um, so are you looking at that region? Whereas in the Philippines, I have a hard time figuring out you know, it's an educated market, but the value there, whether, whether it's there. And then, of course, India, which is clearly by far the most, uh, the largest market outside of China. But the average consumer spending power is is a fraction of what it is in uh, China. Uh, we, we did a story not long ago looking at as a proxy for the value of the Internet um, uh, economy looking at um, dollars spent on digital advertising and it turns out that Southeast Asia uh, has a higher spend than all of India and then if you calculate that means that per capita India's digital spending is, is, is a tiny tiny amount uh, so anyway that, that's sort of my questions like outside of China is there other markets that you guys are looking at and, and or is it just really going to be about China and again I open that to all So maybe if I if I jump in, look, we, we see the strongest momentum in, in China. Um, so 
Um, you know, from a, from a growth perspective, we think that the growth is intact. I mean, two percent this year, probably eight percent next year. Um, so we're we're already seeing that momentum restart. Um, we're seeing capital inflows continuing to increase. So I think we had about fifty billion US coming in in, in, in earlier this year per month. That's increased to one hundred and fifty billion. So um, it shows that I think um, already the market is starting to to, to price in the, um, the additional growth. Um, and we just see a lot of momentum behind uh, the domestic consumption cycle and a lot of momentum behind the digitization cycle as well. So we think both on the equity side and also on the debt side, um, there are reasons to be very positive about China. Um, one thing I would add is that um, from the agri uh, agriculture and food sector, you know, food economy is the uh, largest sector, but is the slowest to adopt the technology. And in Asia, overall, we're talking about a 4.5 billion population, and every one of it is a customer. So whether you are having concern about GHG emission from animal agriculture or the uh, alternative farm inputs that might impact the farmer's health, I think we're, we are all facing um, the same challenges in the farming system and we need innovation from every direction. So when we are looking at the investment opportunity in the agri tech or food tech space, we're, we're thinking about not just only for the China uh, to implement and commercialize at scale, but also how that can uh, be potentially applied to the Southeast Asian countries. And for instance, the egg drones and the egg robotics that now becoming very, very popular in the China ecosystem you know, backed by the BAT recently in the, in the past three months, all these products, when we are really evaluating, you know, how the addressable market size could be implemented for the company in the future, we're all thinking that those robotics could be implemented um, in India or in Philippines or Indonesia and other regions. Um, so so I, I don't think that um, we are only looking into China. I think we're all facing the, the same opportunity and challenges. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our strategy is to, to invest in Europe and scale in China, right? So we are trying to combine the leading European um, you know, technologies, research capabilities, particularly strong in the, in the healthcare space. Um, the issue in Europe is that it's, you know, it's fairly fragmented, you know, for, for companies you know, that want to grow. I mean, they have to deal with 27 different, you know, reimbursement systems, you know, um, have to really go from country to country, really going to a market like China, which is large, homogeneous, uh, makes a lot of sense, right? And this is what, uh, where we see the key opportunity. And, um, be, you know, uh, uh, because of the, um, you know, China, US um, issues, we're, we've seen an enormous shift of, you know, mm -hmm. Chinese corporates, um, you know, really looking, now focusing much more on Europe, right? Um, and uh, looking to license European technologies, partner with European technology companies. So, um, you know, I have to, you know, fully agree with uh, Matilda's comments, you know, earlier. Um, I think, um, you know, the, uh, I think the opportunity for Europe here is enormous, right? Um, a, you know, a lot of government funding in China available for technology companies that are coming into the market, uh, corporates that you know are cash rich, are looking to for investment, licensing, and you know M and A opportunities. Um, so I, I think it's um, it's pretty well aligned, you know, especially in the healthcare space. Interesting, and you're not finding, um, you know, the door the, the welcome mat is placed for European companies. There's no fallout from Huawei or other issues uh, that might be impacting what you guys are doing. No, I think the, the interest on both ends is stronger than I've ever seen in the last five years. Interesting. So the vacuum, the pullback of the U.S. market is an opening yeah. for the European. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Tian, where do you... Yeah, I think just another point is, um, it's not just in terms of where to focus, um, it's not just about growth. It's, it's where the risk-adjusted opportunities, risk-adjusted return opportunities are. And, and one big driver of that is um, is really understanding what's going on um, locally. Um, you know, I mentioned in Asia, I mean, the, the, the macro numbers look great. It's uh, you know, a quarter of a billion people. The uh, median age is 32 years old. So the ability to accept the future growth potential um, is certainly there, whether it's China, US, I mean, the aging population getting towards the, the top of the curve. So, but that said, um, in order to take advantage of it, you've basically got to be able to navigate 
um, more locally, and that's where we rely on our, on, on our long-term partners there um, to, to help us with that process. Um, but, but when you're thinking about uh, allocation of capital and going in, it, it's hard for uh, the international capital to get comfortable with a relatively new market like Indonesia, which has, has had a bit of a spotty past in terms of uh, uh, issues with invest, uh, international investment. Um, but at the same time, having purely a, 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 a international group coming in and thinking they can, uh, they know the market better than the locals, it just won't work. So, so, so particularly in the private markets where we deal a lot with, um, we, we really need that that, that symbiotic um, sort of partnership um, uh, in order for that to work. But that's where we think there's some really really good opportunities because that takes a lot of hard work and it's it's not that easy to create. Right. Um- I just wanted to let the audience know uh, if they have any questions, if they could post them in the comments section, um, and then we'll try to get to them, uh, maybe leave, maybe uh, depending on how many questions, between five and ten minutes at the end of the session. So if uh, if any of the audience members want to put a comment uh, in the comments section, um, I believe I'll be able to see that and then be able to to raise that with, with our uh, panelists. Um, uh, Matilda, I'm just curious about the food tech stuff. So, you know, given COVID... Um, and now China's saying that COVID can come in frozen food just to make me more paranoid about everything I do when I leave the house. Um, are you seeing a shift in what people want to do? You mentioned drones, and that's another kind of cliche about like, oh, COVID, everyone wants automation. But I'm sort of wondering, like, within the food sector, is there more interest now in, like, investing in, you know, UV radiation to thoroughly, you know, make sure my my clams casino uh, don't have any trace of uh, any viral infection or whatever it may be. Yeah, I think first of all, with COVID nineteen and uh, also the growing geographic tension disrupting the global food supply chain, um, I we do we do see this environment as a accelerator, not a hindrance for innovation. And uh, if you look at uh, the uh, agri-food investment activities in China, out of the $3.6 billion that went into this agri-food sector last year, more than 80% of those funding went into the downstream sector. So as we know, uh, the, the, the e-commerce, the meal delivery, the coffee shop chain, the meal tea chain, et cetera. But in, uh, from our investment in strategy, without the midstream and offspring supply chain innovation for technology advancement on how food can be better produced and better delivered, Delivered, it will hinder the sustainable down sector uh, growth. And that's why, you know, uh, our focus uh, has been prioritizing the companies that can focus on precision agriculture, uh, crop and animal health, human health and nutrition. How can we really uh, use those technology solutions to address those challenges in the food supply chain? And just, I, I thought one of the challenges with China is scale, right? That it's mostly, despite uh, you know, economic reform beginning in the countryside, the countryside is actually remarkably um, lagging, uh, primarily because it's still multiple tiny, tiny little uh, plots run by individual farmer families. So when you talk about these sort of industrial solutions, are they actually, is there space for them? How do you apply these solutions in, in such a fragmented market? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the Chinese government uh, has the determination to modernize uh, the agriculture. And uh, one uh, specific policy that they have been starting to push is how they can transform uh, those small uh, family smallholder farmers to uh, scale up into a industrial life farming operation so that the technology adoption will make economic sense. Um, so their mission is that by 2030, uh, nearly 30% of the arable lands will be handled by professional farm owners to also address the aging population issues in the farm and village side. Um, and so they basically now can allow those smallholder farmers to borrow their lands into uh, those co-op to give it to you know farm owners around age 45 to 55 to really manage the fund. Uh, farms. So that is a very good policy change that uh, it will allow more of those unmanned vehicles or agrobotics to be implemented in the farm. 
Um, so this is also uh, why we, we also have been, uh, I would say that this year, more than 40% of our deal flows are related to ag tech. And that really also highlighted the, the growing needs uh, for disruption in, in the ag tech. Right, and I know that um, uh, Pinduoduo uh, is making a big push into yeah. investing into uh, the upstream of farm production. So even if uh, it looks like you have multiple choices for exits, it could be a public market exit or it could be an acquisition, right, by one of these bigger players, whether it's Ali or, or somebody like a Pinduoduo. Yeah, and then the other big signal that we also, uh, you know, uh, seeing in the market is the the launch of the SciTech Innovation Board um, in uh, last year. That you know, previously all the largest tech company Alibaba, Tencent, Xiaomi were all listed in uh, Hong Kong or in the U.S. But now this type of Innovation Board is really doing its job to allow the Chinese tech companies to access the local funding from the public market. And we're starting to see more and more machine learning companies, industrial biotech com companies receiving the world's largest PE ratio uh, from, from this movement. And so I think this will also bring more appetite uh, for the crossover institutions to come into this space. That's interesting. So that actually, that's a great segue. So we talk about the markets, but China is kind of a bizarro land market because the capital can't come in and out easily, right? So if you're, um, Michael, for example, do you want to do an exit? Would you be interested in, or would your families be interested in investing in a Chinese company that would do a domestic IPO that would list on the SciTech board? So in, in a word, yes. I mean, we'll have some fa some some families who absolutely um, would would want to get exposure to to companies in China, which would which would list domestically. Um, we'll have other other families who who prefer to see listings in in, in Hong Kong, Singapore, or, or elsewhere. Um, so difficult to generalize, but I, I definitely see an increasing interest in in getting exposure to, to to the real economy in China. Now, is that because the the wealth is coming from China? Uh, it could be, but it, it's not necessarily. I mean, I think you're you're starting to see also um, um, international families looking at China and trying to understand how to get more exposure to to the real economy there. You know, in the in the past, the sort of the first or the second wave, there was there, there was sort of a a, you know, a belief that um, you could invest through Hong Kong, you could invest in European companies who, who have exposure to, to to the Chinese economy through their through their businesses. But I think increasingly with this new new cycle of um, domestic uh, domestic marketization, there's a, there's a real demand to get direct exposure to, to those businesses as well. And so being happy with your money being parked in China. So it's an IPO domestically. If it's a China IPO, that money can't get out very easily. Being, being happy to have an allocation um, within your portfolio to, to China. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Daniel, how does that, is that something that you guys are looking at when, when you're doing these scales? Are you considering like, I mean, because the valuations in the Chinese domestic markets are, are um, I'm trying to find a word that implies um, rich, let's call them rich valuations. That's sort of almost a neutral term. Absolutely. I mean, there's um, obviously a huge, you know, valuation, um, you know, arbitrage potential between Europe and China. And um, what we've done in some cases is set up um, local JVs, you know, of our portfolio companies in China, mm -hmm. um, leverage, you know, some of the, you know, fairly generous grant funding that you get at, you know, local government level in China um, to really kickstart uh, China growth, you know, build a local team, license, you know, certain uh, types of technology, maybe doing some own, you know, IP generation in China and really filling this, you know, local entity with, um, with substance and uh, and then there's a potential actually to IPO this China entity, and we, we've seen cases where um, you know the, the China subsidiary actually had a much larger valuation increase than the mother company in Europe, right? And um, if you look at the you know uh, for example the you know health tech space, now you can list um, you know in, in Hong Kong you can um, list um, you know companies you know fairly you know early stage companies um, you know with strong growth potential so I think it's definitely in you know a route exit route that we are considering right not just for the European company but also for you know subsidiaries JVs that we're setting up in mainland China interesting that's a real shift in in uh, I think this the success of the SciTech board uh, you know they've been the China's been talking about uh, a NASDAQ like board for a long time and each one just became 
uh, they, were, they were failures, right, frankly. They became sort of casino-like, uh, you know, scandal-ridden. But this one seems to have actually gotten uh, real traction, and I can see the shift in people's thinking. Uh, and partly because even, even, the, even though the anti-PO didn't happen, I think it's still, on the one hand, it's like, oh, great, well, the Chinese government can pull this IPO at the last minute, so this is the complete... It shows you still who's in charge in China. But the other hand, does show you that well, at least they got this far along in the process. So there's some validity to this market, right? Um, Sam, how do you see this with what you're dealing with, with with your investments and looking at like the rise of the Chinese market? Yeah, I mean, Judge, uh, we're we're less focused on China at the moment. Um, hmm. But but if I um, um, in, in my past life I was, and, and certainly a perspective I'd like to take is uh, um, is one that um, the international um, uh, public markets um, can only uh, absorb a fraction of the uh, businesses in China. Uh, there are a lot of structural issues. A lot of uh, you've got to offshore, do lots of different structuring that a lot of companies, you know, just just can't or don't see the need to. So that that actually excludes a large part of the Chinese um, uh, 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 opportunity from the international investors. I think the other um, aspect which you highlighted as well was. Um, you know, there are growing pains. Um, the, the, the New York Stock Exchange, the U.S. stock market, was written with insider trading, written with all sorts of problems 100 years ago. So they've had a, a, a century to kind of figure that out. And China's only had like a couple of decades. So, so being able to do what it's done, I think it's, it's extremely um, 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 successful. But this is the way to go. So, so I think if everyone sees the journey, I think that's, uh, that's probably the better way to look at it. Um, but I, I feel there's no doubt that it's part of the global asset application, um, trying to get access to China in its core, and not just from the international markets. How you get there, liquidity-wise, et cetera, that's going to be an evolving story. Interesting. Um, I was hoping to get some questions written in on the comments from the audience. We have only a, a few minutes left, um, but uh, somehow either I my technology technological skills uh, are lacking or, or the audience is um, just riveted by what we're saying, so not asking questions. Um, so in the last couple of minutes, uh, well, Tian, it's just surprising to me that you're saying you're not that focused on China, whereas like where everyone else is very much focused on China. Why is that? Um, I guess over the last uh, couple of years, we, we don't really have uh, as much of um, it's it's a, it's a uh, we tend to be focused on very micro individual specific situations um, where we have an edge over everyone else. Um, right now, uh, it used to be that capital was a source of differentiation. It is no longer a source of differentiation in uh, in China. Uh, there's a lot of domestic capital available. And it is much more efficient. Uh, the Chinese and their own company is a lot better than uh, um, outside. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the other reason is that, um, you know, there's a lot of, in the last couple of decades, a lot of domestic experience expertise has, has evolved uh, domestically as well. So as a, as a firm that tends to parish within and try to uh, institutionalize um, uh, emerging small medium sized businesses, what's the niche that we can bring? And I think that edge is um, more limited at the moment. Uh, and so we decided to not spend a lot of time in China. A uh, question from the audience. How do we see this? Anyone want to take this one? India is a potential uh, destination for investment. you got a minute and 43 seconds. Anyone want to take India? Michael, your, your, your portfolio, Singapore is sort of the gateway to both uh, India, Southeast Asia, and China. Do you, is your, are your clients looking at India increasingly? Uh, they, they do as part of the, the global allocation. Um, uh, and you, you're absolutely right. I think in terms of that link between Singapore and India, it's extremely strong. Um, so so there's, definitely, there's definitely interest. Um, you know, I, I go back to what I said before, though. I think um, I think when people look around the region at the moment from an investment perspective, um, China continues to, to to get the you know majority of the focus. Interesting. Um, and someone else asked about Japan as a destination for startups in particular. We haven't touched upon Japan at all. It's such a separate. It's almost a separate ecosystem. It doesn't really interact the same way. 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. And the last one, uh, when the markets will be able to make use of the COVID vaccine, I'm not quite sure I follow that. Um, uh, but we're about wrapped up in uh, less than half a minute. I just wanted to reiterate my thanks for everyone giving so generously of their time. I learned a lot. Uh, I hope the audience did. I hope you also found it uh, as panelists that it wasn't a complete waste of your morning, but it was actually added something to your day. And we should all stay in touch and maybe one day meet in real life. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Cheers.